everybody, and welcome back to another episode of This Week's Stoke. I know it's been an awesome season, and we've had a ton of fun entering, interviewing a bunch of athletes, but today we're starting to switch gears a little bit, and we're going into the topic of the spring, and that's going to be development. So I'm super excited to start this off with one of the greats, one of the amazing ski racers who's really set the foundation for women in the sport, and that is Tamara McKinney. So I'm super excited because she is here to share some of her knowledge with us and what she's doing and giving back to the sport. So Tamara McKinney is a four-time World Cup title winner and actually won the overall title in 1983. And it's kind of perfect timing because Michaela Schifrin secured her World Cup title today. So I am so excited to share some of her knowledge with you guys. And we're so lucky to have her on today. So welcome, Tamara. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Parker. So. Nice to see you. Yeah, and to get started, I think everybody should know who you are, but just in case they don't, I think we just need in to, case they don't, just in case, I think we need to really go back and talk about your career. Um, it is really a huge part of ski racing, and you've done so much for women in the sport. So can we talk a little bit about your path as a ski racer and where you started and where you ended up in your career? And then we can talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Absolutely. Let's go. So just to start it off, let's go through your career. Where did you start? Where are you from? How did you really get into ski racing? And you've really had crazy seasons of ups and downs, but really you did find a lot of success. So can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, how much time do you have actually? Because it's, it's sort of a long story, but- uh, you, can give us, you can give us the quick one, it's okay. I'll, I'll try to give you the, the um, shortened versions since we don't have all day. Um, so I'm the youngest of, of eight McKinney's and four of my older siblings, uh, were on the U S ski team. Um, and so I kind of grew up in, in the culture of athletes. My, both of my parents were steeplechase jockeys. That's riding horses over the jumps, sort of like ski or cross, but with horses, you know, uh, Great it's the comparison. To, to roller derby and bull riding you can do on a horse and um anyway both my parents were athletes uh, my mom played uh, tennis in college she went to school in uh, new york city and um anyway so i came from a, a, a real athletic background grew up doing tons of sports riding horses playing tennis water skiing um and it was not unusual to have a three or four sport day on any given day for us. Um, so, so when my siblings were on the U.S. ski team, we sort of started out at a small area called Sky Tavern. My mom was teaching skiing there and then went on to Mount Rose. And at Mount Rose, so this is uh, the, the Nevada side of the Sierras just down from Tahoe. Yep. Um, uh, we were lucky enough when I was really young, I was probably seven, eight years old. Andrel Molter, who was the big champion Austrian skier in the 19, I guess it would have been 1950s and 60s on the Austrian team. He was in the 1960 Olympics in Squaw Valley and fell in love with the area. So he became the coach at Mount Rose Ski Area. His, um, his good friend and teammate, Christian Pravda, who is a little more well-known in America, um, uh, brought him to Mount Rose. And we got to be coached. It was a small team. We got to be coached by Andra Mulcher. And the year after he started coaching at Mount Rose, three of my siblings made the U.S. ski team. So I just thought it was it was sort of a natural path. I didn't realize that not everybody was, was into that, but I saw my older siblings and I would ski with them and train with them and they, you know, get me dialed in and make sure my hands were up. And I was taking the speed from the steeps to the flats. And, and um, so I think because my older siblings were successful and, and, you know, they made the national team pretty young, um, but there was a different system then where they didn't have age group racing as much. I mean, they did for um, like U12 and under, that was, they, those were called fours and fives and above fours and fives, uh, 
it was just a how fast you skied. So then they had rankings of A, B, C, D racers, depending on points. So if you came out of fours and fives and you could ski at a high level, then all of a sudden you could ski with 17, 18, whatever. Interesting. Um, so yeah, anyway, so my siblings made the US ski team very young. My brother won the junior nationals at 14 when the mares were racing. I think they were in Glen Ellen. Glen Ellen, was it in Vermont? Mount Ellen in Sugarbush? Uh, yeah, I think there, yeah, there was an area, I think they called it Glen Ellen or Glen Ellen, whatever. I was young, so I just remember it was a big deal because he won the junior national slalom. Yep. Um, so my sister was an all event skier. So it was Sheila, McLean, and Steve. And she skied everything. She was amazing. McLean was more slalom and giant slalom than my brother Steve was downhill. So yep. they all made the national team that year. And I think I was eight. So I was just following them around and I got to watch them race and come to Aspen where I'm coaching now. Um, and it was just, uh, I was just trying to keep up. So my brother McLean would always try to give me the technical uh, tips. And my brother Steve took it upon himself to make sure that I was, um, uh, you know, toughened up, I guess. I remember being more scared free skiing behind him on his 220s because he always free skied on his 220s. And I would just be trying to keep up, you know, my skis all over the place and skiing in chop and powder and crust and bumps and whatever. And we would, you know, ski ridiculously fast through all conditions, but it was really fun. But we were kind of all around ski throughout. I just felt like I had people sort of helping me. So that was my experience is that, you know, I was around these enthusiastic people who were world, they had world competition, world level competition experience. Experience to share. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, back. yeah, they had a taste of a bigger picture. No, it's, it really is something to talk about how you can have such an influence on so many people and be this person that's given back to the sport. And it is true. I remember like having you coach me a couple of times and it was amazing. It's so cool to get your passion for the sport and combine that with my passion of the sport. And you do that for all different athletes. And I think that that's a really huge part of how ski racing development really is going to continue moving forward. You want to see that love of the sport and the drive to just love to ski and become the best skier that you can possibly be continue. And so yeah. here you are trying to do that as you continue to coach young kids and really drive that passion and that fun. And so I think really to finish off the interview, we got to talk a little bit about what do you think about U.S. development as we are just finishing up an Olympic year, moving into the future? We have a new head of U.S. Ski and Snowboard. It's an important conversation to have. Are we doing the right things? Are there things that we can do better? We've talked about that joy, that fun, the balance between gait training and free skiing. Are there ways that we can continue to push those methods to more kids in the country to see faster skiing as we move down the line? Yeah, well, I think that's the million dollar question <laughs> literally yeah um, <laughs> and um i think that there are there are probably some there's probably some room for improvement um i think there always is right i think one of the things um like when i was racing and I would get down to the bottom and, and maybe it wasn't a great run or, you know, there was a big mistake. And, uh, and so it was a little joke that I had with my coach. If, if it was potentially a bad day, um, I would say, well, at least I left myself plenty of room for improvement. So. <laughs> um, That's one way I, to stay positive. <laughs> Right. And so you have to, you have to find a way to, to be inspired, to, to do better. Um, I think we can do better. And I, I think I, I was just talking with Jill, who I coach with here in Aspen and we were, we were so 
um, inspired by the documentary on the Norwegian um, Norwegian philosophy, I guess, yep. of um, at younger age groups, they're not allowed to time or keep score. It's they. Interesting. I'll, I'll send it to you. So it's a way to, you know, get get into the sport, get your feet into to what's going on, but. But the team atmosphere is a huge part of what they do, and bringing people along together helps them support one another as 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 friends and yep. teammates. But it also helps them. You know, they're very competitive. They're they they always want to push. They always want to, you know, beat their friend or 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 you know, it goes back and forth. And I think, I think the the plus minus over the last maybe 10 years, 15 years, there have been some fantastic results, right? Bodie and Lindsay and um, Julia and Michaela is a phenom. She's, she's an anomaly really. Yep. But <clears throat> because they were so phenomenal, they, Michaela excluded, the others came from teen programs where they were able to evolve, but once they got to be stars, they did their own thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, rightly so, there were injuries, there were, there were various factors that played into that. Um, and Michaela's parents were masters racers who, who had a philosophy to train their children. Yep. And, and Michaela was able to thrive in that. In that life. environment. Yeah. And in that life. In that environment. But I think as a development strategy for the country, I think it's important to, to look at what's working as a team and, in my opinion, what's working as a team, as far as depth of teams, you know, you can look at um, Norway as really a, the standard of what's working. Right. Um, and they're, and they're demonstrating that this season and really prior seasons, just how much depth they truly have in their men's and women's side. Yeah. And the love they have for each other. You see that there's a team, a, a team atmosphere. And, and, and I do think, you know, the, the, the fracturing of our team, uh, there, there are reasons that it happened, yep. but I think if you have a group of three or four kids that you can bring up together, and we're seeing that here, you bring yep. them up together, they push each other, they, they, it's healthy competition. Yeah. And I think, there are some people who can do the solo mission private coaching, but it's a very lonely path. It's a and lonely way to ski race. It's a lonely way to ski race. And, and, um, and I think it's, you're not going to necessarily give your child the benefit of the joy of the sport by starting off in a solo. It's sort of, I guess it's the version of, uh, you know, going to going to uh, a school and having having your friends and having you know still focusing on your studies. You went to you went to Boston College. You had you know your teammates. You have this experience of yes, competing with one another. But, but also you know, we're a team and we're striving for the same goals and we would like yeah. to see all of each other succeed. And it's yeah. a different, it's a different environment. And I think that's what college teaches a lot of ski racers yeah. as they're moving through that pipeline is it's not just about me. It's about right. all of us. And right. I think that that helps push the group collectively. Yeah. And I, I, um, I never, ever, ever, ever want to be the, the, the former, <laughs> ski racer who says, oh, back in my day, blah, blah, blah. But 
the one thing that because I was able to go through many years on the World Cup, uh, I think if you span from the first race at 14 to 1989, when it was my last race, I think it yep. would be 13 years. So you learned a lot 13, of lessons. In yeah, in those years 13 the years, Cup. there were a lot of lessons, but the most successful time period of our, our team as a team with depth. Yep. Um, was uh, in the time period where we had a coach who, who kind of laid down the law and he said, okay, on the hill, you're racers, you, you know, you, you can do this, you work hard, uh, but we come down and we're a team. Yep. And when your teammate is on the podium, you go and you cheer for your teammate. And, and, and it, he came into a fractured team where if somebody had a bad day, they, you know, throw their equipment down yep. and go sulk and not come to awards. And, and there was, you know, a fair amount of animosity he came into yep. and he said, you don't have to be best friends, but you respect one another. And we, we that made the difference. Yeah, we go to dinner, we eat together, we respect one another, and at dinner, you're ladies. You, you put on nice clothes, we're not coming to dinner in our sweatpants, and, and I remember him sort of laying down this, this kind of structure, and, and I remember thinking, I wonder if, I wonder if, it, if people will listen. And sure enough, gradually, you know, as we went on, people it listened, take... results came in, you got along, there was respect. It, it's like, yeah. And it was also yeah. like, we worked really hard. We had, so that was Michelle Rudigo's. Yep. And uh, he has a restaurant now in Sun Valley called Michelle's Christiania. And in the restaurant, he has photos of, of those years and he calls it his Olympic bar. That's and, cool. um, uh, but but his, he had such a love of the sport, but he also exuded love and respect for us. Yep. So when we, when we weren't doing well, we still got coaching, yep. right? And that's, I think that's the thing that gets a little backwards in, in, in some cases where the higher up a coach gets in their level of certification and color of their jacket, the more it becomes about the coach and they'll talk to the athlete if they're winning and if they're not, they're sort of in trouble, right? Yeah. Or, and so being able to, to have an atmosphere where, where you feel like it's family, I think I think that's what the Norwegians are doing. I think that's when you can get that, that it is a love of the sport and a, you know, it's like your work family. Um, but it's also having that net to know that you can push your boundaries and fail and be caught and know yeah. that people have your back. And I think in this sport where 99% of the time it doesn't go your way yeah. to have people that support you and help push you back up is what yeah. you need to continue to succeed. And I really love that your idea of a team is a family because it really is. You're spending all day traveling all over, all season, all year with this group of your teammates. Yeah. So if you don't feel like a family, then what are you doing? Well, yeah, it's, it's lonely. And, and you can also have that love and respect for your competitors. Yep. You don't have to give away, like it doesn't cost you anything. And I think that's another thing, teaching girls, the boys have to learn it as well, but I think girls need to learn it <laughs> pretty quickly. Girls need to learn it like that, that mean girls movie. I think yep. sometimes there can be a mean girl thing that goes on and they don't realize that it takes nothing away from your talent and, and capabilities to be nice. be nice to your teammate or, yep. 
or to to just not say the snarky thing. Yeah. So, you know, be be the be the person who who can say, oh, don't worry, you'll get it next time. Or be that person. Don't feel like there's one scrap of crumb and you have to fight and claw and scratch out the eyes for it, right? To, yep. to lift one another up, everybody gets stronger. And maybe maybe proof of that. So the one, the one, uh, the one thing I just wanted to say, because Michelle is so proud of it, that team that he created with, we were, I'm trying to remember how many of us were winning World Cup races across the board. Um, A lot. I think in, in those years, anyway, maybe eight, there were eight different winners in a season. So that across, and you know. Incredible depth speed events right and and um tech races so we're all pushing each other we're not giving up any of our strength for each other but we're pushing each other but still we would have we would have a thanksgiving together and laugh and and appreciate the whatever you know there are a lot of differences and maybe people that you wouldn't hang out with normally but there was that you know the number one rule was respect and yeah. and we were we won the nation's cup that year not just in one event but we for the women in the world and i think i think that's possible i think i think that a, a little a little shift may need to happen and and certainly people can can focus on the the solo mission coaching it's right. sort of the difference between the homeschooled athlete, a uh, homeschooled student um, going to medical school at 16. Certainly it's possible, yep. but it's a much lonelier path. And so what if you integrate maybe groups of four or five yep. and, and help them assimilate and and push each other because the reality is even if you're solo mission coaching there's still a world of competition that you have to learn to swim amongst and yeah we've we've covered a lot of ground and i think this interview is extremely important for people to take the time to listen to because this is how ski racing stays fun and grows and in becomes enjoyable for more people and we'll end up seeing more success. And right. so Tamara, it has been incredible to be able to talk to you and for you to share this knowledge with everyone, not only your development, but how you're developing the next generation and really how our entire country can learn from their development, that it takes a village, it's a community sport and we all have to be there for each other because a different, that's what's so cool about ski racing, a different person can win every day. Yeah, and so, so that thing that the, uh, what is it? Uh, think globally, act locally, right? <laughs> yep. It's, it is a family and maybe my biggest competitors, Brenny Schneider and Erica Hess. Yep. I mean, we're friends. We're, I, I got invited to Erica's wedding and Brenny Schneider. Well, we're all friends on social media. Yep. And, and you're connected um, for life this sport we're connected and I, i'll finish with this when when i won the gold medal in Vail, yep and renny was expected to win she was the favorite for various reasons and um and i had been injured the year before so i was not the favorite and i came down uh, it was the combined and i was second in the slalom and third in the downhill she was the first person to me Yep. And she said, I'm so glad you won. For me, the silver medal is as good as the gold, but I'm so glad you won the gold. And it was a genuine hug. It wasn't a ice, it wasn't an icy hug. It was a genuine hug and a genuine like, yeah. It's, I'm proud of you. You've been working hard. We've been working yeah. hard. Yeah. We're standing in one, two right now. Like that's yeah. Crazy. And it was, it was the coolest thing. It was, it was my, the most memorable 
yeah. comment in that moment of, you know, here's someone who could have thrown her equipment down right. like some athletes will do and walked away because she didn't win. And, and that's what came genuinely from her. And so, you know, she's still an uh, all-time record winner of various things on the World Cup and Olympic Games. So, so if we can realize that we are a family, not just, not just locally, not just as a country, but as, as the world, when you go to a race in Europe and world you look in the eyes, yeah. right? You, when we were in Italy, you look in the eyes of those coaches and you think, oh yeah, I know you. Yeah. So, so dropping down our, our differences or what we, what we think is uh, competition. It's usually the people who don't know about competition that think you have to be um, isolated right. because you can be competitive and thrive with people. Yes, 100%. And I can't thank you enough. And I'm so excited to share this with our SYNC community because that is a huge value that I try and share every day, that it's giving back to the sport, it's being a part of the sport, and it's helping everybody grow on their paths to their dreams and goals. So thank you so much. And I hope I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you, Parker. Good to talk to you. And, uh, and I, I'm going to um, send that documentary to you to have a look at. And, uh, awesome. It's, no, that'd be great. And I'll share it with the SYNC community as well. Great. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.